I'm Bob Whitley. I've been representing injured people in North Carolina since 1974, and I love what I do. I can't imagine anything any more rewarding than to help injured people, deserving people, receive fair compensation from a big, powerful insurance company. I've represented thousands of people, and I've helped them get a fair recovery. And I've come to learn from them that they have a lot of questions, and there are a lot of uncertainties, and you're probably facing that now. I'm going to use my experience and address those questions and provide information over the course of this tape. Let me start with some basic information and maybe some vocabulary. First of all, you are the one who has a claim, and you're going to be referred to by the insurance company as the claimant. That means you have a claim. You have a claim for personal injuries. You may also have a claim for property damage. Now, the insurance company who's responsible for your injuries, they're going to open a file and it's called the claims file. And they'll assign one of their employees to manage the claims file. That employee is called an adjuster. Now, I think we're more accustomed to the term insurance agent as opposed to insurance adjuster. The agent's the person from whom we buy our policy, we meet with every year, always very friendly. But the adjuster, he works for that same insurance company or, or the insurance company for the responsible party, and his job is to settle your claim. But, but let me share something with you about the adjuster that you need to remember. And this is as important as anything I will say in this tape. Remember that the adjuster has no legal obligation to you. He works for the insurance company, and his job is to save the insurance company money. Now, these adjusters are well-trained professionals. Now, basically, they're nice people and they're doing their job, but part of their job is to gain your confidence. And, the, and one of the things they're gonna do is discourage you from getting legal advice or certainly hiring a lawyer. They'll, they may tell you that the lawyer's gonna get all the money or that you don't need an attorney. But the real reason they're telling you that, because the insurance statistics indicate that individuals who use attorneys to handle claims generally recover two to three and a half times more money than people who don't use lawyers. So that's really the reason they don't want you to talk to a lawyer, and they certainly wouldn't want you to watch a tape like this and get accurate, helpful legal information. Now, speaking of claims, I'm going to talk just briefly about a property damage claim, and that's the damage to your car. If your car is drivable and repairable, the responsible insurance company's got to pay to have it repaired. And if it has to stay in the shop to be repaired, they're going to be responsible for furnishing a rental during that time. If your car is not drivable now, then they're going to be responsible for paying you every day that you're without your car. Now, a lot of our clients, you know, their knee-jerk reaction is they want a rental car. But sometimes you're better off to get the money or the value of a rental car each day than to actually get a rental car, particularly if you've got another one available or from a friend or a family. Now, if your car is totaled, and, and kind of the rule there is if it costs more to fix it than it's worth, then the insurance company's got to pay you the reasonable market value of your car. And unfortunately, sometimes this isn't what that car is worth to you. It's probably more valuable to you. It's what it would be worth on a used car lot somewhere. And, and I think this is sometimes grossly unfair because what it does essentially is it forces you to sell your car at a price that you don't completely control. But that's what happens when your car is totaled. They've got to pay you the fair value. Now, there's another aspect of property damage I want to briefly discuss, and that is diminished value. Sometimes this is referred to as depreciation. This is when more than 25% of the total value of your car is damaged, which means that you have to disclose that if you sell it or trade it. So if there's a perfect body job done on your car and it's completely repaired just like and looks like it did before the wreck it still has a diminished value because when it when you come when it comes time to sell it 
or trade it, you have to disclose that. So I want to discuss this about property damage because some of you may have already confronted this or may be confronting this now as you're watching this tape. Now, the second type of claim and the one that I really want to talk about during the course of this tape is your personal injury claim. And a personal injury claim is composed of certain elements. The first and simplest element is your medical expenses. You're entitled to all of your medical expenses. And that includes your prescription drug charges. It includes transportation for medical treatment. Everything related to your medical treatment that has resulted from this injury you've received. Not only the expenses that you've had in the past and are incurring now, but any future medical expenses. The second element is loss of time from work or lost wages. Every hour that you miss from work because of these injuries, you're entitled to be compensated for as an element of your personal injury claim. Now, sometimes clients are surprised when I tell them, even if you're paid under a sick leave plan or some other type benefits from your employer, the responsible insurance companies should not benefit from the fact that you have that coverage and that you've had those benefits and that you've earned them because you're probably going to have to give them up now if you use them. That still becomes part of your claim for personal injury because that's something you've paid for. So like medical expenses, it does also include any lost income that you have in the future. They are the two simplest elements of a personal injury claim. Third element and one that's a little bit more complicated, is pain and suffering. There's no formula for that. You know, even when judges try cases and they tell the jury what they've got to use as guidelines, basically the judge says, use your common sense and your good judgment. What we look at in determining what we think is fair for pain and suffering are things like the extent of your injuries. How bad was it? Were you in pain just a few days, a few hours, or were you in pain weeks and months? And certainly if your pain is permanent, just imagine how much worse it would be if you sustain an injury that causes you pain for the rest of your life. So certainly physical pain and mental suffering are an important element of your personal injury claim. There are other elements. Fourth one is permanent injury. Certainly if you have a permanent injury, you're entitled to much more compensation than you would be if you don't have a permanent injury scars and disfigurement, uh, the loss of use of part of your body. But all of these elements make up the elements of your personal injury claim. Now that I've briefly discussed these elements, I want to talk to you about the question that I get asked the most, and that is, how much is my claim worth? And I usually get asked that pretty early on in the course of handling a claim. And I hope that you now see that you can't know what your claim is worth until you've totaled up all of these elements. And that usually can't happen until you've completed your treatment. Because the more expenses you have, the more pain you have, the more permanent your injury is, the more your case is worth. So until you have reached what is called maximum medical improvement, that is you're as well as you're going to get, you don't know what all of your expenses are, your medical expenses, your lost time from work, and your pain and suffering. So only then can you assess the value of the claim, because it kind of relates to the second most asked question, and that is, when am I going to get my money? When can I settle my case? And you certainly can't do it until you know the total of all of these elements. I want to very quickly share some helpful information with you. First of all, with regard to your group medical insurance, please file on that plan if you have it. A lot of our clients are reluctant to file on their own medical policy because it's the other driver's fault, but you should always file on your policy. You know, it's coverage you've paid for. Either your employer has paid for it or you've paid for it out of your own pocket. And in the a responsible insurance company certainly is not going to benefit from the fact that you have that coverage. Sometimes the plan requires that it be paid back once you have a recovery from the responsible insurance company, and that's called subrogation. But that's okay because it at least gets your bills paid sooner rather than later. 
I also want to talk about your medical payment coverage. This is what you usually have on your own automobile policy. Usually that's $1,000, $2,000, sometimes $5,000. But it covers medical expenses that you have or anyone in your car has as a result of an accident. And again, some of our clients are reluctant to file on their medical payment plan because it was somebody else's fault. But let me point out to you, you've paid for that coverage, and it's to benefit you. If you look at your premium notice, you'll see that you've paid extra to have medical payment coverage. And usually, it will not cause your premium to go up if you file on that plan, and it has absolutely nothing to do with your personal injury claim and the claim for medical expenses against the responsible insurance company. If you're in someone else's car, and you have medical expenses, you can recover the medical payment coverage that they have on their car, regardless of whose fault it is. But you also may be able to recover from your own med pay because it covers you even in another vehicle. And sometimes that, that term sometimes is stacking the coverage of the car you're in with your own coverage. And I just mention that so that you will bring it to your agent's attention if you've been in a wreck that you want to file on your med pay. Now, one other thing about that medical payment coverage that I've learned, a lot of times when our clients report to their own insurance agent that they've, they've been in an accident and they tell them that it was the other driver's fault, they're almost sometimes immediately told, well, you know, there's nothing that you would recover from your own policy. You know, the other policy will pay for everything. But let me point out to you, you need to insist with your agent that they file your medical payment coverage because... Um, you are entitled to that, and the fact that it's someone else's fault doesn't diminish your entitlement to that coverage which you've paid for. Another suggestion is to take plenty of pictures. You know, we have full-time investigators in our firm who go out and take pictures of the wreck scene and the automobiles, but I would encourage you to take pictures of your injuries, particularly, you know, soon after an accident. Sometimes these pictures of your injuries can be helpful in convincing an adjuster later about the extent of your injuries. Uh, a lot of times bruising will show, but will eventually heal. And then the adjuster will have some argument that perhaps you weren't injured. And certainly pictures of bruising would show the extent of your injury. So take plenty of pictures of your vehicle, of your injuries. And in our office, we also take plenty of pictures of the accident scene. With so much construction these days, accident scenes can change. Now, in getting medical treatment, let me make a few comments. You need to go to the doctor as soon as possible. Any delay you have in going to a doctor and seeking medical treatment could be used by the adjuster later in contending that you might not have been injured or certainly weren't, weren't injured very seriously. You should keep all of your doctor's appointments. If for some reason you can't, call and let them know you won't be there. When you see gaps in treatment, Insurance adjusters like to use that as some argument that you must not have been injured quite so seriously or you wouldn't have missed those appointments. And when you talk to your doctor, be thorough. Be sure that you tell him or her about all of your injuries. You know, a typical one we have a lot is, let's say you hit your chest in the, with the steering wheel and you have pretty serious chest injuries, and you also hit your knee on the dash. But as your chest heals and starts to feel better, you notice that that knee injury is nagging and is not going away. Well, it's important for you to have mentioned that knee injury very early in your medical treatment because you don't want the adjuster to be able to say later, well, maybe you didn't injure that knee in the accident since it's not mentioned in your initial medical records. Be precise and be accurate. Don't leave anything out. And when you're telling your doctor or your medical provider about the accident itself, be accurate about that. If someone ran a stop sign, say that. Don't say that it was a stoplight because they'll take these notes and those notes will end up in your claims file in the hands of the adjuster. I'd also encourage you not to exaggerate with your doctor. You probably have serious enough symptoms anyway. But sometimes doctors pick up on patients who might be trying to embellish their symptoms, and they put those in the notes. And certainly adjusters will use those later as a way of diminishing the value of your claim. 
You should also keep a detailed diary with notes of your medical progress, notes of how you're doing. For example, the first day that you can dress yourself, the first day that you're able to go back to work, and maybe function normally after the wreck. But a detailed diary can be very useful in dealing with the adjuster. I want to talk to you now about getting legal advice and hiring an attorney. You know, in North Carolina, it's easy to get good legal advice. There are plenty of personal injury law firms who will be glad to answer your questions and provide advice for you without charging and even to meet with you. And one topic that you really should get advice about is the value of your claim. You know, we talked about those elements earlier. How in the world are you going to know what the value of your claim is unless you get some independent advice from someone other than the adjuster? If you don't get, get advice, then you're going to have to rely on what the adjuster says. And remember, it's his company paying the claim. So it's always a good idea to get advice, and it's usually free. Hiring a lawyer. You know, when you hire a lawyer, even a trial lawyer, it doesn't mean that you're going to necessarily go to court. Our clients really don't want to go to court. They just want to be treated fairly. But when you hire a lawyer, you're sending a message to the insurance company that you mean business. And if you've been seriously injured, you need to mean business. And if a reasonable settlement cannot be reached, then you've got a lawyer that can take it further if you have to. Now, I use, this is my rule about whether I think I should be hired because a lot of people ask me, Mr. Whitley, should I hire you to handle this case for me? And the, the main criteria I use is that if I can't recover more compensation for you after you pay my attorney fee than you could on your own without paying an attorney fee, then I think probably you don't need to hire me. Now, I have an exception to that, and that applies to people who simply are not able to handle the stress and what you go through in handling these claims and in dealing with the judge. Some people just want it off their plate, even though it may not make a big economic difference. Now, that's the criteria that I use generally, but I want to talk to you now about serious injuries because I don't mind telling you this. If you have sustained a serious injury from an automobile accident, then I think you should definitely hire a lawyer, and the sooner, the better. Now, you may wonder, well, what do I mean by serious injury? And let me just give some examples, and, and I won't include all of them, I'm sure, but these are some examples of what I consider to be serious injuries. If you're hospitalized at all, even one day or night, as a result of these injuries, if you miss an extended time from work because of your injuries, if you have to have surgery or have to have metal placed in your body, if you sustain a head injury, loss of consciousness, then I would consider that a serious injury.